Okay, well, welcome uh, everybody. I'm so glad you're with us and staying with us. I'm really delighted to be able to talk with um, Kim Knowles and Carrie uh, about this, these remarkable films as they relate to um, work that's part of an ongoing involvement that they're considering related to an edited volume that they're working on together, but also considering the nature of these films in relationship to um, experimental cinema and ways of thinking about how these three different films are related to each other and how we can start thinking about uh, putting things together in a number of different ways based on the different backgrounds. Uh, so Carrie Noland has taught in the French department at UC Irvine for many years, starting with poetry, uh, and is quite a renowned scholar related to the gesture and dance, particularly with her recent book about Merce Cunningham, Merce Cunningham who she knew growing up in New York, <laughs> uh, oddly enough. And uh, with Kim Knowles, her work on photochemical practice is so revelatory and interesting in terms of extending ways of thinking about avant-garde cinema and ways of conceiving of the work of uh, cinema and film as a medium, along with her work on Man Ray. So what I thought we would do is start with um, uh, Kim describing a little bit more about the choice of the three films and its relationship to how she's uh, presented them in the past, just to give us a clear context uh, for how they're shown and some of the issues that had come up in terms of how she was pairing them and related themes. Yeah, uh, all, of the, all three of these films um, uh, came to me, well, I know the, the last, the, the, the filmmakers of the last two films, um, I know them, know them quite well. Mm -hmm. And I screened both, um, both of those films at Edinburgh. And I actually discovered Blua um, by chance through mm -hmm. the submissions process. Um, and it's not, unlike the last two films, it's not particularly well known on the mm -hmm. experimental film scene. Um, and I have been fascinated with that film since I saw it in 2015. Um, and I've been, I have to say that my, my curatorial practice has been central for me in, um, in my uh, research and, and my writing. So a lot of the filmmakers that I write about mm -hmm. and the, the, the films that I'm analysing and the ideas that I come up with are, you know, through encounters at the, at the Edinburgh Film Festival. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a number of years that I've been thinking about the representation of um, environmental issues, ecology, uh, and that that film blew. I just really planted a seed for me, um, and then I've I've presented them in different contexts in in different combinations of, over the past few years, um, and I and I guess what. What's interesting for me in all of those films is this this idea of um, I mean of course as as you you see in the in the films we're not we're not just looking at you know nice multi species interactions we're looking at all different forms of human non human well not all but you know a, a kind of spectrum of different ways in which humans and non humans interact or the way that we are actually um, intricately tied to, to animals in, in, in different ways as pets, um, as, uh, as sort of a, a resource for, for science. Um, and the, the, there's a, a nice tension in all of those films between um, control and care. I mean, I think uh, even those procedures that are carried out with the mouse, they're violent, but the mm. intricate placing of the, uh, of the body um, on this mini operating table, it's very, it's very carefully 
Mm. You know, the mouse is very carefully laid out. Um, and I feel that the, the, the film making itself, the, the, the techniques that are being used in that film, is sort of about an aesthetics of care. You know, the, 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 the filmmaker's asking us to be aware of the, of the body, to feel the body. Mm. And that's why it's so uncomfortable, because we're so close. We're asked to almost touch that, the, the body of the mouse. So whilst there's this awful sense of, of control and vulnerability, mm -hmm. There's also in the filmmaking style, I think, a, a, an aspect of care. And I think this control and care runs throughout mm. um, all of those films. And then, you know, of course, there's the, um, the shifting between abstract and in all of the films, there's a shifting between abstraction and figuration. There's, um, a, there's always moments in, in the films where the filmmaker draws away from figurative representation mm -hmm. and takes us into a space of sort of, um, you know, embodied sensorial uh, reflection. Um, and so for me, that's, that's, those are the, the interconnections between, between those films, even though they're all doing very different things. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, there's the gaze. In all of the films, you, um, you have the, 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 the eye of the, the eyes of the, the animal. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we constantly meet the, the eyes. Um, and sometimes the, the gaze is very um, explicitly staged. And sometimes it's a little bit more subtle, but the eyes are, are, are very present. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, we know how powerful images of eyes are in, in cinema. I mean, if anyone has ever seen Louis Bunuel's and Shan Daru and the eye slicing <laughs> sequence, you know, we all know how, how powerful and visceral that image of the eye can be. I mean, Man Ray knew it as well. But uh, picking up on figuration and gesture, um, we were talking a little bit earlier about different themes, uh, Carrie, um, that you had been reading into some of the films and also uh, themes that relate to some of your ongoing work in terms of movement and gesture, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in The Masked Monkeys, uh, in the third film that we watched, um, in terms of how, how the monkey is being presented uh, and the extent to which this is, there's a quality of improvisation, structure, culture, nature that's mm. involved with that. And I was wondering, how, how are you conceiving of that or thinking of the, the movement or the, you know, uh, movement of the animal, you know? And is it a form of um, uh, control culture? How are, you, how are you looking at it? Well, yeah, we were talking earlier about the mm -hmm. fact that I approach these films as a dance and movement mm -hmm. scholar. And so it's hard for me to uh, think about them except in terms of the movement of the animal on the screen. And uh, I can give you a couple of things that came to me just watching them this, this third time tonight, uh, which is that there's a questioning, it seems to me, in the film about animal gestures and human gestures and as forms of communication, mm -hmm. as forms of behavior, but also as forms of communication. So for instance, um, with respect to communication in the first film in Blua, it's really remarkable in the scene when the tiger is walking back and forth and you have the frame of the vitrine of the zoo and then you have the camera frame and then you have the kind of opaque scratched or, or you know, the, the, some kind of um, viscous mm -hmm. <laughs> viscosity on the surface of the glass. And then the, you pan over to the moving tiger. Um, so there's a lot of frames around the movement of the tiger. And the first words that are uttered in, the, in that episode are, can you make him stand? Uh, mm. They're trying to get the tiger to stand up. So the boy, yes, he does the thing about carne and showing his, his chest, but he also 
is reaching up. And at one point, the tiger does reach up. And so it's a really strange moment in the film because you don't know if standing up is, um, <laughs> is understood by the tiger physically in the same way as standing up is understood by the, by the people who are observing him, but there is an understanding of the, there's an interpretation on the part of the humans of the behavior of the tiger. There's a, um, a kind of empathy that's going on there. Um, standing up means something for both bodies. And then to give you another um, example, uh, the dancer with the deer. Uh, you know, we can, as a dancer, I can really predict the kind of movement that the human body is going to do, but it's hard for me to predict the movement of the deer. <laughs> and the deer's movement has a different pace, it has a different um, uh, ton tonicity, you know, mm -hmm. the, the deer moves in a very fast, sudden way, as opposed to the dancer that's very fluid in, in most of the scene. And you notice that she goes on all fours. And that echoes as an earlier scene when there's the, the deer on the upper screen mm. and the upside down woman mm. um, who's also on all fours. And it's as if she were advancing a paw. So the, the film seems to be playing with the, the similarity in gestures, the imitation mm. in gestures, make him stand up, you know, have him imitate me. Um, there's, a, there's a real echo effect. And then finally, just, um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but um, the first words of the last film, The Masked Monkey, are, it all begins with the hands. Mm. Mm. We first see the hand, right? What, what defines primates, you know, the opposable thumb, you know, and the, um, the more evolved form, in quotes, of the human hand. And then the first time we see the monkey is the monkey's hand mm. that's reaching over that's the, right. the yeah. door of the cage. So I see these, um, these films, I don't know what to do with the mouse. That I really, <laughs> it's like, don't ask me about the mouse. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do see this, this questioning of similarity versus difference, communication versus opacity of communication and lack of transparency. I think that's what's going on for me. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the hands because that, that opening sequence, um, uh, I'm thinking about uh, a scholar called Erin Brannigan, who mm -hmm. a, a dance. She works on dance and film, and doesn't isn't sh isn't there a, a a section in her work where she's talking about the hands, the expressivity of hands, um, and hands are quite a, a, a kind of common uh, object in uh, experimental cinema. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning of the film, we have this really beautiful I mean that's what they're that's mm -hmm. what the voiceover is talking about the choreography of the mm -hmm. of the hand and it's actually very very gentle and in comparison with the you know the violence of this um, control over mm -hmm. these um, well that, that's interesting that you bring up Erin Brannigan's work because one of the things that she's really interested in is the interface between cinema and performance mm -hmm. and she kind of is engaged in that paradigm around screen dance mm -hmm. that's been a little bit more broadly worked out by mm -hmm. a number of other people but what's so interesting about her work is going in and out of the space of performance through film that almost there's almost this um means by which um film functions in these different ways relative to performance. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it a document of performance? Is it um, an, express, an expression in its own manner, uh, given the formal properties of film? And going back to Labarat, one of the fascinating elements of that is that in so many ways, it's a research film. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a number of research films. They're, they're genres of a sort that are specialized, um, you know, such that um, they're really part of the research process. Mm -hmm. So the manner in which this film is basically turning it into an experimental film of sorts is very interesting because it's uh, remaking uh, the intention of how the film was originally shot, uh, which is really about measuring uh, the effects of 
whatever kind of fluid is being injected mm -hmm. into the mouse mm -hmm. to determine weight um, and effects that they're able to measure. But then it's turned into something else altogether thanks to the score, thanks to um, mm -hmm. the coloration, whether it's done with a printer after the fact or digitally, it turns it into some other kind of aesthetic experience that's powerful in many ways. Mm -hmm. But I, I was interested, Kim, I mean, being that you've seen the film a number of times, um, what, what do you think the major questions are that the film is asking us? I mean, I, for me, it, 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 the, the more I see the film, the more I, I see it as, um, uh, well, I mean, like the, like the last film, Masked, Masked Monkeys, it's, uh, it's drawing attention to documentary conventions in order to break them. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I'm endless, endlessly interested in is um, the way that experimental and documentary come together as, you know, genres, if we can call experimental mm -hmm. film a genre. Um, and, you, you know, pushing the boundaries of what we understand as documentary film, you know, what, what, what is documentary? What, how, do we, how do we define it and how can we redefine it? Um, and so I really feel like those two films are, are, are redefining the documentary genre, but then it's also laying bare the instruments of, uh, of, of documentary, which is, you know, rare, of course, you know, Jean Rouge did it with mm -hmm. Chronicle of a Summer, mm -hmm. but it, it's generally, this, it remains quite rare, doesn't it, that, that documentary filmmakers draw attention to that extent, um, uh, to, the, to the, the filmmaking processes. Um, so it seems to me that they're in some way um, paralleling the precision um, and the, the processes, the, 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 the very methodical way in which the procedure is taking place, mm -hmm. that's mirrored in the, in the documenting of the, of the filmmaking itself. Um, but I think, you know, on a, on a broader level, it's, it's a film that really wants us to um, have a, a, a physical experience of this process. You know, it's hard mm -hmm. to watch. Um, and it's hard to watch for, for, I mean, we were talking about this in terms of empathy, kind of vis visual empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's hard to watch because, because of the, the proximity, you know, the way that we're drawn into that really close uh, relationship with the body of the mouse and the skin at some point, the close up is so close. I mean, they're using macro photography. Um, it's, it, it could be any skin. Mm -hmm. At some mm -hmm. point, the skin mm -hmm. fills the screen, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it resembles human skin, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. it, it could be... It, mm -hmm. it, it, the, the, the origin of the skin starts mm -hmm. to fall away, and, we, and we, we, we see that emphasis on, you know, we are all one and the same. Right. We, we, we are, mm. the, you know, there's something that, 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 that draws us all together, you know, we are kind of of the earth. <clears throat> um, and I think the, the filmmakers are, are wanting to draw attention to that whilst also resisting any kind of commentary, resisting any, mm. taking up any kind of position in relation to the ethics mm. <clears throat> of, the, of, of what's happening. So it's quite unusual in a film in, the, in that it's showing us something really very, very difficult and uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but doesn't take up a position in, in relation to it. I mean, it's like, this is what happens. Well, you know, what I'm wondering about also related to the comments you've both been making is the issue of whether or not staging animals through cinema or in this cinematic uh, kind of context of experimental film is making them actually more human than the human agents that are enabling it. So there's a kind of reversal that's uh, being staged as well in the process of making films about um, these animals as being either uh, dreamlike, uh, as with Blua, mm -hmm. um, agents of a performance um, in Masked Monkeys, or the experimental mouse, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a sense, they're in this subjected position to some, to some extent in all three films. And then 
the extent to which there's a, a kind of idea about, um, you know, the condition of subjugation mm -hmm. to some extent that's being represented that makes them more human, more, um, uh, more of a, a site for sympathy than the human agents themselves who are staging all of this, who are sort of invisible in mm -hmm. the process. Well, are they even, I mean, in a certain sense, you could say that the trainers mm -hmm. in Max Monkey um, are in a relationship to the animals that, say, d directors or cinematographers are to actors. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a, you know, the performer is being manipulated, right, which is the kind of meta commentary on. Mm -hmm cinematic relationships, mm -hmm. but I mean, I just think of that scene that I was talking to you about where the monkey is having his or her or their arms pinned behind mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. like this by a kind of a, I don't know, it's like a rod or something mm -hmm. that, and they're being pinned and you see the expression on the face of the, and that, that's a scene of subjugation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. introduced as disciplining. Um, yeah, and creating the, the performance or mm -hmm. the performer Mm -hmm. And you're said. saying that's humanizing of the of the animal, of the monkey. Well, the 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 idea of how the animals are being positioned mm -hmm. and framed is is in a sense putting them at the center mm -hmm. of what the films are about to a large extent. So, you know, by doing that, they're they're already. Um, I don't know if I would call them protagonists, but they're they're figures. They're they're not they're not characters either. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't necessarily have a. They're not like human actors in films or in narrative films, but they're they're in a position that uh, you know for which our attention is focused, and that's significant to the extent that we're trying to understand them, we're projecting onto them. Mm. And in that way, we're, we are humanizing them if we start looking at them in that way. That's why the switch with Laborat is really fascinating because we're shifting from a lab film into an experimental film mm. that's opening up a different set of questions. But it, it, it's interesting, the this idea of the animal as a as an actor mm -hmm. because i think what's what's fascinating about that sequence in in blue where the the woman is talking to the dog mm -hmm. is that you know <laughs> we we don't find many instances in film where an animal is playing a role unless it's like you know unless that the, the, the character of the animal is at the center of the film mm -hmm. anyway. So the film, I, I mean, I, I can't think of any examples. Um, I can only think of like, you know, um, what's La the- Lassie. Lassie <laughs> and uh, Lassie Bam Bam Bambi and, you know, the, the anim animated films, but also non-animated films where the film is centered around the story of an animal. Okay, mm -hmm. that's one thing. Sure. And then, you know, and then you've got the, the humorous uh, animation like Ratatouille or, you know, Finding Nemo. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, it's rare that we see an animal placed on the same level as a human. Is that humanizing? I mean, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I'm, it, it's, it's really difficult uh, terrain to, to navigate, isn't it? But you, the, the, the both... Um, the, the dog and the human occupy a, a sort of equal parts, equal um, proportions of the frame. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, also talking about hands, there is this mm -hmm. moment, it's quite beautiful, where you have the hands of the woman and the paws of the dog. Um, okay, you know, it's possible to sort of idealise that and say, mm -hmm. well, you know, that's, that's, that's surely not all we need in order to revolutionize kind of cinematic representations of animals is it just to kind of put to to put them in the mm -hmm, same frame mm -hmm. and, but i think there's something quite interesting going on there about uh, you know how we might represent animals on on screen mm -hmm. another feature of the films and experimental cinema in general has to do with format mm. you know whether 
uh, filmmakers who are using uh, Super 8, 16 millimeter, or um, more and more digital formats, which is, always seems to be the way in which they're projected. And there's always this issue about um, the body of the film, the ways in which the film itself is being manipulated, um, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the image that's been photographed. Um, and I, I, I thought what was interesting, you know, Labourette is a good example of that in terms of uh, post-production ways in which to manipulate the film. But I, I think more generally talking about experimental cinema, do you see any of these films as examples of types of films that are being made? Um, you know, do, are they part of a, a subgenre in a way in terms of what makers are interested in now? I think one of the things that's, that's, that's really, well, you know, there's two things going on here. There's the, um, the way that, that 16 millimeter is being mm -hmm. used um, despite people thinking that, you know, films only are made in digital now. Um, so that, you know, on the one hand, you have people that are uh, persisting with that medium, like Guillaume Caillot, like mm -hmm. the is made entirely on, on 16 millimeter. But then, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting work happening with film and where film and digital come together, mm -hmm. uh, now th that uh, hybrid mode of making films. But then there's also something really interesting happening around documentary. I feel like documentary is something, you know, somewhere to look in experimental film, contemporary experimental film aesthetics, the way that the, the boundaries are, are constantly being, being pushed and the, the use of fictionalization mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. bringing together fiction and non-fiction um, within the same film so that you know you're really walking a tightrope all the time wondering you know what's what's going on here is this fiction non-fiction mm -hmm. um, I mean I think you know the act of the act of killing kind of you know brought that into a, a, a more mainstream not mainstream but you know feature length uh, absolutely. context uh, and, absolutely um, and I and I think that that that's a similar kind of thing I mean you have Leviathan as well mm -hmm. um, uh, from the sensory ethnography lab, the, the, the documentary is, is is fascinating when you bring it into uh, mm -hmm. into contact with with experimental mm -hmm. cinema because then it just becomes like well, mm -hmm. you know, I see. I say to my students, "You think documentary is boring? You know, <laughs> I'll show you some stuff that you, that you won't be bored by." Well, it, it is an interesting <laughs> point that you're making about the transformation of uh, documentary um, techniques or styles that are in a sense being transformed. And one thing I was thinking about a lot with all three films is um, the soundtrack or, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was an experimental soundtrack um, that was commissioned like with Labourette and also with Blua, mm -hmm. there's a kind of attention to the sound. And then in the, in the third film, uh, Mass Monkey, uh, this voiceover narration, which is, always the sort of vanishing point for a certain style of documentary filmmaking, the, you know, the, the voice, the precision of the voice, mm -hmm. the manner in which um, action on the screen is being described, context is being filled in. You know, that I thought was a very interesting way in which to work with these kinds of elements that are sort of being repurposed. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the thinking with regard to documentary cinema as being a kind of basis uh, for experimentation and transformation mm. in this relationship to mm. a kind of idea of reality. It, it, it's fascinating because I, I have a tendency to overlook sound in, in the way that I write about films, but it's, it's kind of, it's impossible to ignore in those three mm -hmm. films, isn't it? And I wonder, I mean, I wonder to what extent our difficulty with with watching Labourette is to do with the the, the sound. You know, there's something mm -hmm. about the, the sound of the cutting, um, which makes it it makes it much more visceral. Um, and it's the, it's the same in in Masked Monkeys with the the strobe 
section. It's the, it's the, it's the sound, that, that the repetition of sound that, that takes us to a, a particular place. And it's a it, similar thing going on at the, at the beginning of, um, of Bluer, mm -hmm. where you have this uh, breath, uh, the breath of the, of the dog. And I guess that takes us back to the, the breath, the breathing, the beating heart of the, of the mouse in Labarat that you, that you mentioned, that what makes it, what makes it so hard to watch is that you can, the, you, there's a breath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This thing mm -hmm. is alive, there's a breath. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, yeah, breath, breath in cinema. Wow, isn't that, isn't that kind of understudied as well? The dog breath. is breathing too in yeah, the, yeah. the scene with the almost strobe effect at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to go back to something you were saying before about the humanizing, because I think one of the things in, in the paper that you're writing uh, that you weren't able to present here, but that I've heard twice, <laughs> uh, that you were trying to trouble is this distinction between humanizing and animalizing mm -hmm. or being a human and being an animal. I think one of the things that Blewett does that's really interesting is um, in the fiction part, <laughs> uh, when the mother says, I was a crocodile, She's sitting there, and in that dialogue, her monologue, her short monologue, she is uh, blurring the dis the boundaries. Um, and you know, the son's face uh, expresses our incredulity. <laughs> but but there's um, a, asking the question of whether the animal is being humanized, if the uh, trainers are becoming beasts. You know it. It doesn't seem to me the right question because I think the films themselves are working towards blurring that boundary. You know, what, why are there so many shots of hands and claws and paws? You know, there's also the bear's, mm. we see the bottom mm. of the bear's paw that looks a lot like um, the scaliness, well, kind of the leatheriness of the tortoise coming out of its mm. shell. Or the, you know, there's this playing about uh, on surfaces, the hand, the mother's hand has a, almost a kind of a leathery f look to it. Mm. And I, I don't read the films as trying to humanize the animals, mm -hmm. even though that you could say that saying that the dog was in your belly is, <laughs> you know, it, is either humanizing or it's getting rid of the boundary. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's playing with that. But I see that as, as a much more complex, um, not so much a metaphor, but a, a suggestion of a way of thinking mm -hmm. about the yeah the the, the the interconnected nature of uh, of of. of all things, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we do have non-humans inside us. We have, we are, we are inhabited by non-human forms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, we have all this. We have stuff inside us. So, okay, yeah. She's not going to give birth to a dog, but <laughs> there's. There's a, there's something going on there. I think mm -hmm. that is is trying to express the in, inexpressible, um, and it, it's not it's not as simple as a metaphor, is it? But it's a it's an invitation, I think, to a, a way of a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, well, why don't we mm. open it up mm. for questions? How, how would that be? Mm. Um, so. Yeah, we, we'd love to hear from you and to hear your reflections about the films uh, and the, the discussion that we're having about them. I couldn't help but think about um, Etienne Jules Marie and the way he sort of strapped on a sort of string with a camera mm. photograph of some sort to record the movements of birds. And it seems to me maybe there's this way of... Um, sensing the worlds of animals by a detection that in itself could be one of control. Mm -hmm. And something that I am thinking about right now, especially with Laborat, is this relationship with proximity and empathy. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering in what ways could 
proximity lent itself to an effective empathy with these creatures, but one that's sort of not dependent on a gaze either, because actually I felt as if looking at the rat's eyes, I didn't really, you know, its eyes were so bloodshot red compared to the gaze of like a donkey or of a dog. And so I felt that my empathy towards a rat was more of a different type of proximity. So I'm sort of wondering in a way, has cinema privileged too much the eye with regard to animals if so much of its early development, especially, was that of the eye, the animal, and tracking movement? I mean, what, one thing I could say related to um, the work of Etienne Jules Marais, the early filmmaker whose work sort of evolved from uh, glass plate photography or, or dry plate photography into moving image photography is the idea that it was uh, part of a development related to measurement, measurement of movement and time. Um, and with this experimental format, uh, one of the things that starts to change and evolve is thinking about um, how to upend uh, certain kinds of conventions mm -hmm. of how we see things. So the modernity of you know, early inventions associated with moving images was really about how do you represent movement in time. Uh, and with experimental cinema, one of the things that you're addressing most often is the issue of how does um, the sort of established um, machine, apparatus, uh, institution, um, in a sense, enable these different means by which to show things and represent things and open up these new kinds of questions of how do you interrupt, how do you ask different kinds of questions, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the things that's happening with um, you know all of these films mm -hmm. in different ways, um, leading us to ask different questions than we would otherwise, as opposed to the establishment of the the, the institution, the apparatus, the, the manner in which to show movement as a, as a grounding basis to think about what, what is it? What is this means of doing it? But, but just to play devil's advocate, uh -huh. <laughs> because I think your question is fabulous. Um, it, you, it could be argued that not much has changed <laughs> Because if you the the this last scene in uh, in Blua where the bird is being held by its mm -hmm. feet and mm -hmm. flapping its wings and you see this unbelievably shapely tonic muscularity of the bird's mm -hmm. torso as it's flapping its wings um, you see the muscles rippling. Uh, we're still fascinated with the filming of movement. Mm. And calculating measurement of movement is a cross-species um, mm. quantifier. I mean, you, you use the same calculus to, well, I, what do I know about calculus? But you use the same <laughs> me <laughs> you see, measuring uh, tools uh, to measure the movement uh, and the tempo of the movement of an animal as you would for a, a human animal, right? So I think, first of all, that that kind of gaze on movement is a one that levels um, mm -hmm. different types of living and non-living things, anything that moves, um, because it all can be measured by the same instruments. Um, but also did wonder watching that scene with the bird whether we've moved so far from Marais actually because mm -hmm. the fascination mm -hmm. with the body's muscles is still really um, present. But that sequence is also about, you know, it's a highly um, mediated, I mean, of course, <laughs> all the films are mediated, right? But that is, um, that's using, a, I think it's 500 frames per second. Um, oh, camera, is that? Yeah, yeah, so it's a, it's a, I think that's, it's actually seven seconds of, of footage that, mm -hmm. that stretched out to, to um, a few minutes. So that's also, 
I think that 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 sequence is also about a kind of fascination with break using technology to mm. break break movement down. Um, that I mean, she told me that she she was interested in like seeing how a bird moves, how how you know mm. how the how the wings move and. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is also a, 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 a. I'm speaking about empathy. It's that containment. I mean, I think mm. containment is so is so key to all of those films. That restriction of movement. You know, the, the, it, mm. it comes across to me as it's quite quite violent. You know, holding, arresting movement in that way, mm -hmm. by you know not allowing the the bird to to take off to do what what feels natural um, and that's like the you know the containment I mean it it, it actually makes me feel quite mm. breathless you know when I see the mm -hmm. the, 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 monk, the mm. chain around the, the neck um, and then you know the vulnerability of the mouse I mean the, the, this shot with the the, the paws that were the feet in the air mm -hmm. I mean there's just something so so profound about that, but also mm -hmm. so so simple, that vulnerability that you spoke about, I think, when we were discussing the film at some point. You said that what, what you what you found difficult was that sort of, you know, the vulnerability of that thing, that small being, you know, that is still a life, you know, it's a life. Thank you so much. Um, I thought maybe we could end the evening with something slightly more lighthearted and <laughs> I was just going to ask about um, kind of the palette, the affective palette of experimental cinema and these moments and these, all three films actually had humorous moments, even Labo Rat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else wanted to giggle when the tiny MRI was unveiled, but I, <laughs> I, I really wanted to laugh. And it, and it kind of was like a leveling moment and I thought that was actually really interesting. And so if you could speak to, I guess, other audiences' reactions or other films huh. that might play with this mm -hmm. as a, and I think also to speak to the movement and gesture, there are some films where the humor was actually coming from the gestural, like uh, the masked monkeys and the grooming scene at the mm -hmm. end, um, and others where it was coming from the, the text or the narrative, mm -hmm. so. I think people sort of tend to forget that experimental cinema is also funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I say to my students, it's funny you can laugh, you know, they kind of <laughs> think they're afraid to laugh because they think that it's not appropriate with experimental film. I mean, you know, experimental film is like, it's playful as well. And it's about, it's about like having an, an openness, um, a sort of radical openness that allows for an openness of fluidness of thought. And often that does in, in involve humour, whether it's intentional or, or not. Um, and, I, and I think, yeah, humour is a, is a way of, of bringing someone closer, isn't it? Um, mm. And I think that, yeah, that there are lots of, I think, unintentional moments of humour in, in Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. and like the, the bit that always mm. makes me chuckle is, and, and it's not funny at all, actually, but it, <laughs> it's where the, one of the mice are take, is taken out of the, the cage and the other one sort of, you know, looks, mm. pops its head out mm -hmm. um, really briefly and then goes scurrying back in. And I, why is that funny to me? I don't know. I just had this... <laughs> really weird juxtaposition of it doesn't the lion in the MGM like come out of a a, of a hole oh, oh yeah yeah and yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And, and the beginning the first shot of Labo Rat is the rat it's I think it's a mouse I don't know it's a mouse, but, oh, it's yeah. a mouse, a mouse yeah. Yeah. sticking its face out you know it's out of the hole that's such a strange <laughs> thought that you know, the MGM rat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we've, we've been talking in some of the other um, presentations about a film called La Vache qui Rumine, so the cow that, that ruminates. Uh, it's, a, it's a really small film from 1969, and it, and it basically just shows a cow chewing and then occasionally looking mm -hmm. at the camera. <laughs> And, uh, and I've been really fascinated with how that elicits like, laughter in the audience. 
why, what's, you know, and that is about gesture, it's mm. about the kind of, you know, the meeting, meeting the gaze of who, the filmmaker, the camera, uh, I don't know, but, you know, there are certain animals do things that we find funny. Why is that? Like, why, what is it about animal gesture, movement? Well, isn't it when they're most like us? I mean, yeah, isn't the, yeah. you know, monkeying, right? Mm -hmm. Saint-Jay in French means to imitate. Mm -hmm. You know, to be in a monkey is to imitate. And maybe that's, you know, you asked about the grooming, you know, isn't that the most humanoid kind of mo moment? Um, well, I don't know. There's a lot of behaviors of that monkey that are, to me, very legible, and I could be completely misconstruing the gestures and the expressions, the facial expressions of the monkey. But there, um, so certainly, I think laughter is linked to seeing animals do something that looks like something a human would do. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree. I, that mm. just seems to be to where a lot of animal humor comes from. Mm. Great. So why don't we leave it at that? Thank you so much, Kim and Carrie, and Thank for you. bringing these marvelous films. Thank you. <laughs>